Okay, well, look, first of all, thank you for joining us this morning. I uh, really appreciate your time. I know how busy everybody is at the moment. Pretty hot topic we're talking about today. Um, for those that don't know me, perhaps haven't met before, um, my name is Stephen Knight. I'm the CEO of Pimento. Um, this is our sixth panel discussion of the year. Um, we did about 13, 14 events weekly, and then periodically every sort of six to eight weeks, we have a, a session um, both for brands and for agencies. So welcome if you're a brand and uh, welcome if you're an agency today. Uh, you'll notice we have a new name for our panel sessions. They're now called uh, Marketing Spice Live, and this is a part of a portfolio of content we're running right across the year across various channels, uh, and those include podcasts, um, white papers, and these webinars. Um, these sessions, as I say, are designed for brand owners, agencies, consultants, um, and guests. Um, so in, in future, if you want to invite any of your colleagues, they're very welcome to attend. As in previous calls, uh, please, we do encourage you to use the chat box, which is at the bottom of your screen. If you've got any questions, or you'd like to make any comments, or you'd like to specifically say something or, or drop into one of the debating conversations, either raise your hand, um, or uh, which you can do uh, digitally or physically, or if, if possible, just drop a, a message into uh, the message box or the chat box. So today's uh, session is entitled Recession, What Recession? Uh, we have four very senior panelists with today and, and one pollster who together have lived through 15 recessions in their own working lives. I uh, kind of think of it, I think I've actually witnessed five of my own. On our panel, we have Rebecca Cook, who sits on the main board of leadership uh, team at SOMO, uh, whose, resp whose responsibilities include growth uh, for the agency, both globally, and she also chairs the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Council. Uh, she acts as a trusted media spokesperson for businesses and digital and technology matters, often commenting uh, within the national press, and you've probably seen her a few times in the Beeb. Outside of Rebecca's day-to-day -day role, she has a number of non-exec positions advising across um, various businesses, organizational resilience, digital, customer experience, and governance matters. She currently sits on uh, as an NED for the NHS and for TfL's London Transport Museum, as well as being a trustee with the Royal Pavilion and in Brighton, wonderful place. And Rubens has over 25 years experience of delivering digital first strategic communications, both agency and client side. Uh, formerly, he headed up um, within Disney, the film division, and when it came to marketing and launched over 400 films, uh, he then started his own agency, which he ran for 15 years, uh, an award-winning global integrated communication agency called Way to Blue. He sold that in 2018, and he now runs The Arc, a consultancy dedicated to agency growth and M&A. Um, and I guess his point of difference is that he takes a very holistic approach and focusing on the people in those transactions. Uh, he's a passionate advocate of well-being and has interests in diversity and inclusion and also works with Action for Children. Cindy Eldo is um, a founding partner at the Leonardo Advisory and a senior advisor on organisational culture with 25 years boardroom level experience. And before even Peter Drucker famously stated that culture eats strategy for breakfast, Cindy was working with leaders who understood how a great culture can be translated into competitive advantage. Great to have you here today. And then finally, as our fourth panelist, we have Spencer Gallagher, who is the CEO and co-founder of Cactus and Agency Nomics. Many of you will know Spencer. Um, Cactus is a leading corporate advisory and growth consultancy for agencies. The Cactus team has supported thousands of agency owners globally over the last 12 years in growing, buying, and selling their businesses. He's a former agency owner himself. He's also the co-author of Agency Nomics, the Amazon five-star rated best-selling book and audiobook aimed to help all types of agencies scale from startup to the first five million in revenue. So we have a top team on our panel, but before we get to that, um, we thought we would do a bit of a scene setting and uh, Oliver's going to take us through some up-to-the-minute research uh, and some insights that um, they've conducted for us this week. Uh, for those that haven't met Oliver before, he's been on a number of our calls. Uh, he heads up the public division within Savanta has overall responsibility for all client research in central and local government, education, charities, and public health, as well as the company's political polling. So he's going to be a busy man for the next 24 hours. He's a member of Savanta's executive leadership team, and prior to Savanta, he was managing director at leading communications and public policy agency, Comres. So good morning to you. I'm going to put you in the spotlight for a change, if I may, and um, welcome you to today's session. So uh, hopefully, um, let me make sure I'm sharing screen so you can share our slides. 
Uh, great, thanks, Dave. Good morning. And um, just trying to share. Oh, here we go. Share the slides. Um, it's good to be back um, doing one of these sessions. Um, I think I finalised these slides yesterday, um, and obviously since then quite a lot has happened in the political world. So we're currently uh, running some some snap polling today. So look out for that um, later. I'm just going to put that on presentation mode as well. So hopefully um, you'll be able to. To see that. Um, I'm just going to um, sort of draw on a few different sources of some of our polling over recent weeks and looking back over trends in recent months as, as well. Um, we do a lot of our own polling, we do a lot of polling for um, clients in the media and, and other organisations as well and um, I'm just trying to pull some of that together today um, just to set the scene as Stephen said and um, I, I suppose in way of a summary um, it does paint a little bit of a bleak picture um, at the moment in terms of people's concerns, the impacts on people um, and sort of, yeah, worry um, looking forward as, as well, both from people um, and from, from businesses. Um, so, you know, we're, we are several months in now to this cost of living crisis. I know the year seems to have whizzed by, but, but we are. And we first asked a question to the general public back in January asking, um, of how how worried or not they were about the cost of living and even back then seven in ten um said that they were worried three in ten said they they weren't when we last asked that again in june that had risen to to eight in ten now saying they're worried and um you know perhaps the other way of looking at this is you know only one in five of us across the country is not worried in some way about the cost of living um crisis um so it is genuinely something which is affecting nearly all of us. And when we look at sort of the, the breakdowns across different groups of people, this level of concern is, is actually fairly consistent across a whole range of socio demographics from gender to age to where you live, um, incomes, um, all of that kind of stuff. So it is a, it's a, a widespread societal um, uh, problem. Um, I think in terms of trends as well, I think this one is pretty stark. So we, we also ask people whether um, they expected their personal financial situation to get better um, or worse in the next um, in the next six months. Um, and back in January, 30% said they could see in the next six months it getting worse. Six months later, half of us are saying that. So 49% saying um, saying it'll get worse. Of course, there are always um, more fortunate uh, people um, in in society, and we do still see about. Um, one in five saying that um, things will get better for them personally, and that's always the same proportion who, who aren't worried. Um, so there are there are groups in, in in the population who this isn't really having an impact on, but the vast majority of us it is in some way. Um, and again, just quickly here in terms of like breakdowns, this is it, it, this sort of level of you know feeling things are going to get worse over the six months is present for a lot of us, but particularly for, for people who are sort of in middle age and older ages, uh, that concern tends to be worse. Um, shifting around some of our, our data sources a little bit, um, we, we run something called Brand View um, at Savanta, which basically asks um, uh, several hundred people every day their views on different brands, but also on sort of key other metrics. And one thing we've been tracking with, with people is um, related to kind of spends and how much money they have. Um, available each month um, and we ask people kind of whether you know on a scale whether they're kind of completely unaffected and can carry on spending what they want through to cut all spend and I think what's really interesting um, using this chart and if you sort of move your eyes to the right that dotted black line shows when the energy price cap new, uh, news broke so maybe the start of this um, this crisis you start seeing the red and the uh, orange or yellow line going up and the blue and the green line going down and the red line uh, represent people who are saying they have cut all non-essential spend, all of it. That represents about five million people. Um, and the uh, orange line are those who are, are maybe not cutting everything, but so they are actively looking to save money and, and, and buy things more cheaply. Um, so both of those proportions of the population are going up. Um, people who are saying they're unaffected. Um, and also then the green line, which may be okay, I'm being a bit more cautious, but it's not really too bad yet. Both of those proportions are coming down. Um, I think that just that trend just demonstrates, um, builds on the previous slide showing, you know, it is really having an impact on, on millions of people. And we did a survey recently for the Joseph Roundtree Foundation amongst um, the bottom 40% in terms of household income. Um, and I think they've, they've recently released a report on that. And I think even they were quite shocked by some of the findings that we, we found in that 
you know, millions of people, it's not necessarily just choosing between heating and eating. There are millions of people who are who have had to kind of go without both at some point in, in the last few months. Um, so it is really having um, quite serious impacts um, for, for people. Um, and as well as, you know, not being able to buy food or, you know, heat homes, and maybe that's less of an issue over, over the summer particularly, um, but it does cause stress and it is worrying people. Um, and that is manifesting itself in terms of having a negative impact on people's mental health. So two thirds of the population are saying that the cost of living crisis is having at least some negative effect on their mental health, which is up slightly from January, although it's still over half in, in January. Um, moving on then to sort of think about, you know, who's to, who's to blame and how can we best manage this? Um, it is interesting to see that it's, you know, people are maybe not able to understand exactly where all this comes from and um, the cost of living crisis. And we see that a bit more in, in slides in a moment. Um, you've got kind of, you know, three main culprits there, the government, the war in Ukraine and, and the pandemic with it, you know, at least one in five of, of people saying that those, those um, parties are to, you know, most to blame for this. Some pick energy companies, um, only one in 10 say, say Brexit. So it is um, the more recent things that, that people are kind of looking at, but um, people aren't pinning this solely on, on the government um, and people see a range, of, um, uh, a range of things to blame for this basically. Um, and when it comes to kind of what can we do to um, uh, you know, mitigate the, the impact of these things, basically people are saying just kind of, you know, anything is welcome if they think it will have an effect. So we've got three quarters of people saying windfall tax on energy companies, um, would, they would support that. Um, three quarters nearly again saying they would support an increase in the minimum wage, cutting taxes on uh, taxes on fuel. Um, but even the majority of people saying, you know, scrap the national insurance increase, um, reduce levies on domestic energy bills. So again, you know, there's a lot of worry. There's a lot of people really badly affected. Um, we want you to do something, basically, is the message here. But unfortunately, they don't think the government is doing enough. So only one in four people are saying that currently the government is doing enough um, to support people with um, the rising cost of living. That same quarter, maybe roughly the same proportion who are saying they're not worried and they're not affected um, by it at the moment, um, of course. Um, there's obviously a lot of conversations around, you know, wage increases um, and potentially a summer of strikes and warnings from the Bank of England that we can't just increase wages to keep up with inflation. Um, the public don't necessarily agree with that. Um, only one in 10 people say they don't think their wage should increase to match um, the rising price of goods and services. The vast majority think that they, they do, um, it should, that it should do. Um, so, um, you know, there's challenges there, I think, for businesses in terms of managing that expectation from people. Um, uh, you know, it's, that is you know, quite a stark finding, you know, eight in 10, saying they feel that their wages should be increasing, to, not just increasing, but to match the rising price of goods and services. Um, we found this particularly interesting, I think. Um, traditionally, conservatives always been um, seen as you know, safer hands for the economy. Um, but you can see from this quite stark chart here that Labour are uh, you know, seen as, uh, clearly seen as, as, as better at managing this cost of living crisis. So 39% of people said Labour would be better um, and 24% um, said Conservatives would be better. Ignore the sort of question wording at the bottom there, that's um, for a different chart. But um, interestingly, only half of Conservative voters from 2019 felt that Conservatives would be better, the Conservative government would be better at managing the cost of living crisis than Labour. So um, there is certainly discontent um, in the ranks of traditional um, Tory voters or those who, who at least voted last time. Um, in that context, it is, I think, it really interesting for um, both parties at the moment, um, and let's see where things go over the next few days with the current situation with the government, but nine in ten people say that the party's response to the rising cost of living will be an important factor in terms of how they vote at the ballot box at the next election. So that's basically in line with the state of the NHS, and it's way ahead of, you know, things like um, Partygate or Keir Starmer having having a beer or even environmental issues. This is the key, you know, along with the NHS, this is the key topic that's going to define how people vote at the next general election. 
um, due for 2024, but let's see. Um, and I suppose just to um, summarise all of that, you know, Labour, uh, you know, as well as seeing better to um, manage the cost of living crisis, clearly ahead in the polls, nine points ahead um, based on our most, vote, most recent voting intention, which ran over the weekend. Um, we'll see where that trend goes next after the events of, of this week. Um, so that's kind of where things are with the public and their views on, on these things and how it should be dealt with. Um, of course, you know, there are impacts on businesses as well. And I've just got a few slides here which kind of show that from our, our monthly B2B tracker. There will be more to come on this. I think we've added more questions on the July wave, um, which I think go into a bit more detail, but still I think this starts to, to set, um, set the scene, which is quite similar to the public in that there are quite serious impacts already. Um, I suppose just before we move on to that, a, a piece of context from a survey we ran um, recently is that the public, although they say they think they're more likely to think that price rises are driven by a desire for, by businesses to make profits rather than cover costs, the difference isn't that stark. The grey um, chunk at the bottom, the 30% there, is basically people who can't make up their mind or don't know saying, OK, both reasons, making profits and covering costs equally to blame. But there is certainly a sense from you know, at least a third of the population, that businesses are um, essentially, um, you know, prices are going up because businesses want to make bigger profits um, and not just because they're trying to cover costs, which is a challenge alongside, you know, wage um, increased demands. That is a challenge, I think, for businesses to manage. Um, but in terms of impacts for businesses, um, we, we, our survey is a thousand businesses um, cut between small so um, SMEs and then larger businesses with more than 250 employees with small businesses on the left, large businesses on the right. We see that half of businesses, whether they're sort of large or small, are already actively cutting costs. So that's the green or the purple bars there. Um, only sort of 14% of small businesses, 11% of large businesses saying they're largely unaffected, um, which is quite small proportions. The blue bars, the two in five, saying they're already spending more cautiously. Um, so similar to that sort of big line chart I showed for consumers. Um, where we're starting to see more consumers, you know, really cutting back um, or, or at least, you know, um, looking to, to, to spend less. We're seeing that with businesses um, as well and a big, you know, a, a, certainly a big chunk of businesses, regardless of size. And also, I should say this trend is, is pretty consistent across sector as well. We haven't got too much granularity on that, but from the broader sectors we can break it down by, um, nothing particularly stands out. Um, then looking to the future, as we see a very similar pattern, so um, similar sort of proportions in the, the green and the purple there, um, approaching half, saying that they will be cutting ex you know, expenditure in, in some way. Um, only one in 10 continuing to say over the next six months we're going to be um, unaffected by all of this. So some really big challenges for businesses um, if they're having to cut costs, but also um, employees are, you know, are demanding higher wages. Um, and then finally, you know, what specifically um, you know, have the impacts of rising costs and inflation been? Um, you know, the, we've cut this again by smaller and large businesses. Demand from customers um, is, is, um, has dropped, which is maybe not surprising if people are cutting back on their spending. Um, but also the ability of you know, businesses to, to invest. Um, you know, there's issues with supply chains. We've, you know, we've said that people are, are, are citing um, mental health problems, you know, businesses are recognising that well-being of employees is suffering as well. Um, so there's a whole range of impacts already for businesses, um, and that's maybe before the worst has, has hit. So, um, you know, lots of concern amongst the public, lots of impact already on them and on businesses. Um, and, you know, I think we're yet to see the worst of it as we enter the autumn and um, more energy price rises and people are having to turn their heating on. That's all I was going to go through today, um, but happy to answer any questions um, later on. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Um, okay, let me just, you could just mark us to our screen. Perfect. Okay. Gosh, look at this all. Right. Um, I just want to bring, if I may, all of the panelists into the spotlight. Um, there we go. I'm going to add, I'll find everyone now. Um, just looking at that feedback there and um, the research that's been presented to us, obviously it doesn't paint the best of pictures. Um, I think it's important that when we go through today's session that we also take the opportunity to actually focus on some of the, the positive stuff that's happening out there because there is, you know, still 
lots of good things to be talking about yeah. and, and part of the um, part of this conversation really is recognizing what we can do as brand owners agency owners etc to equip ourselves better for the inevitable downturn in the economy um, so with that in mind um, I'm going to ask if I may the first question of Spencer which is you know why is it you know government's obviously playing down the likelihood of recession uh, it's not using the r word and it's talking about a, uh, a slowdown in growth or no growth um, what do you think that makes this particular situation you know the r word most likely and are we looking at that little blip as we saw as we came out of the covid period you know, where we had a couple of months of negative negative growth or do you think there's something more afoot here is it like to be longer yeah, I mean, if you look at, I mean, first of all, you know, a recession, as we all know, is two consecutive quarters of negative growth. I think from Ollie's presentation, you can see that the business confidence is falling, consumer confidence is, you know, is, in, uh, is decreasing. And so inevitably, those two things are a perfect storm for, 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 for probably the likelihood that we will have two consecutive sessions. And then once that happens, of course, the media and the market confidence drops even further because the hype about a recession is there and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, everyone starts to act and think that way. You know, we do need consumer and business confidence in the marketplace. And obviously agencies especially need that um, because we're a service business and we thrive from that. So I feel that, um, you know, for me, there, there's, there's, you're right that the pandemic was only two quarters but the 1992 recession um and the the uh, 2008 9 recession they were basically both five quarters uh it, so it lasted what a year and a year and a quarter so there's no doubt in my mind that we've got certainly for many people there will be a, a period of about 18 months and I've got a friend who is a CFO for a major utility. And I said to him, you know, what, what makes you think we're going to recession? He said, well, I can always tell because when people start defaulting on their, their utility bills, that's the beginning. And so that's already happening um, when people are defaulting on the basic things like paying utilities. And, and we're not even at the position yet. You know, the, let's not forget this. OK, we've got inflation at, at um, record levels. It's predicted to be 11 percent by the end of this year. Interest rates will have to go up. And for those of you who are around in the 90s, you know that there is a correlation, unfortunately, between increasing interest rates and reducing inflation. The problem was that was in 1992, for me personally, there were more days at the end of the month than there was money. And that's something that you had to kind of live with back then. But nowadays, I think the expectation is, is that people just expect more money to be given to them. I don't think people... I, I worry that generally people have got a different type of mindset in some ways to, to everyone from the report we've just seen there that people are asking for more money. I'm experiencing this a huge amount at the moment with, you know, with the agencies I work with where it's just impossible, like, you know, to keep up with the increases that are being asked. Um, but I, I would say that I think, um, like always, you know, look, my job is to prepare people, you know, for what's happening ahead and there are things that we could all do to to prepare and I think it's important that we come out of today with everyone feeling like they are taking personal and professional action plans to make sure that they can manage the, the, the you know the next 18 months or so okay well let's, let's come back to some of those insights a little bit later on because I think you know anything that we can take away from today's conversation and actually act upon as you say both personally and professionally will be really really useful uh, Cindy, can I just come to you and sort of ask you the question why you think this particular recession is likely to be a bit different to the ones we've seen in the past? Well, um, a lot of clients are asking us at the moment, aren't they? What, what can we do? What should we do? And um, my response is there's no playbook for this one because we have not, you know, there has not been a recession where we have come out of a pandemic and that pandemic has dramatically changed the way we feel about work. Um, you know, it's almost we're in a completely new world anything that's gone before is just almost irrelevant now and actually we know that that dramatic change in way of thinking about work led to the great resignation so what businesses have got now is they've got a double whammy they've got um, rising costs and labour shortages so that, that we've never been there before that's just you know huge and therefore for brands who believe that people are their best asset you know their their number one priority to me and what I'm telling our clients is you need to be able to attract and retain talent. 
that is the thing that's going to get you through this recession. You need to attract and retain talent so that insp inspire them, motivate them, so they support all those really difficult changes you're going to go through, because there's going to be really difficult choices and changes, and you need your people to support those. And also you need those people to be coming up with innovative solutions for your clients and to be thinking creatively and be supporting the business. So how do you do that? And of course, the immediate reaction for all brands is, oh my God, that means salary increases, that's gonna put more pressure you know, on the business. But I would say that that is, yeah, of course you've got to produce cost of living competitive salary, that's number one. But actually there are another four key drivers that actually 60% of employees um, would say it is important and they will stay with an organization or they'll join an organization. And the first one is not, it's a no brainer, but they're saying you need to manage my work life balance. You need to ensure, and this is gonna be a challenge when organizations are under pressure. How do, and there are pressure to perform, pressure on margins. How do you make sure that you retain and look after the well being of, of, of your people? Because they, if you don't, they will walk. Um, the second one is career development. There's a huge amount of data that says employees will stay with an organization if they get career development. And that's not necessarily a cost to the business, but that's about giving them opportunities to work on interesting projects. So there's some non-cost things that you could be doing there, mentoring, um, a whole host of other things. Um, the third one here is purposeful work. We know that Gen Y and Gen Z are, you know, money isn't just the thing that motivates them. They want to do work that has an impact and that they feel that they're making a difference. So an organization needs to keep that, their purpose you know, right at the heart of any changes that they're making, making sure there's no contradiction between what they're saying and what they say their purpose is. Um, and then finally, you know, the key one is culture. Um, we know that all individuals leave organizations because of the culture. And, I think the pressure that brands are going to be on, on um, maintaining their culture and maintaining a culture of flexibility, autonomy, well-being and inclusiveness is going to be a, a big challenge. And that's what leaders need to really keep an eye on and, and make sure they've got the finger on the pulse and they understand the impact of the recession, ambiguity, you know, uncertainty, what is it having on the way that organ their organisation is behaving and is that having a negative impact on their culture or are they managing to retain it and, and look after it? So there's some simple non-cost, yes, um, things that organisations can do, but it's going to require leaders to focus their time on those things. Yeah, I, 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 listen, you can't disagree with any of that because that is absolutely the way to support and grow and uh, both your business, whether you're a brand owner or whether you're an agency. But the cold reality is, you know, agencies and, and brands are going to be faced with some very, very tough decisions over the six, next six to 12 months. And inevitably, therefore, there will be a reduction in the headcounts, which will put further pressure on mental health of those people who are left behind, as it were. Um, and it's also going to be, you know, across the board reductions in training and developing talent. Rebecca, you, you, you sit on, in a, on, a, on a board, you've got something like over 300 employees or team members across uh, not just this market, but in other markets around the world. Um, are you seeing, well, two things, first of all, are clients beginning to tell you they're actually intending to reduce their budgets? And, and the second question is, what, what are you doing when it comes to talent and development? Uh, thanks, um, Stephen. So it was interesting, actually, Oliver, in the research, because you could, did pull out quite a chunk of uh, businesses, both small and larger businesses, that uh, kind of cautious element where people are cautiously thinking about what may we do, what, what might we not do. And we're definitely seeing that across all the industries that we're working with. So clients are still spending money, but they're really, really putting a spotlight and I guess that laser focus on is the agency partner I'm working with really giving me that return on investment? And how can I demonstrate this to my board that we need to continue spending? I think, I mean, I guess I was thinking about having gone through a, a couple of different recessions as kind of an agency leader, kind of what are the things you can do to try and mitigate this? So obviously you preserve as many jobs as possible because the last thing you want to do is to get rid of your amazing talent. You want to keep people and retain them and hopefully be hiring more and more. And I think one of the key things which is quite short-sighted, which is easy for agencies to do, but brands absolutely do this too, is to actually kind of switch off your marketing and your sales focus. And I think that's a real mistake. I think you really, if anything, have, need to have a bigger focus on sales uh, and not just think about how we're going to cut costs in an organisation. 
And I guess from an agency perspective, well, how do you do that? I mean, some industries and some sectors are way more recession proof than others. So I guess if you look at um, retailers that operate in the discount sector, more people will be shopping there than maybe shopping in Waitrose for argument's sake. Um, if you look at maybe um, uh, kind of retailers that, that do things that may be expensive, people may be looking that level down. So I think what you need to do as an agency is really look at how you're now looking to spread your risk, your client portfolio, and not be too focused on industries that will be massively impacted by recession. So I think if anything, you need to be focusing yourselves and marketing teams to go and find those clients and have those conversations and really understand, I think, as an agency partner for your clients, how you can really um, be that trusted partner and how you can help them navigate the recession. Uh, so they're still driving business forward themselves. I think in terms of talent, to your second point, um, it's, it's a real tough one. Um, of course, agencies don't want to get rid of people. And I think the agencies that are shrewd will be the people that keep their people. I mean, even during COVID, you know, unfortunately, a lot of agencies had to let a lot of staff go. Um, we were very fortunate. We, looked, we took a long term view because actually it can be a false economy. You end up spending more money to do redundancies, lay people off. So you need to rehire them, retrain them, bed them back into the culture of the organisation. So I think if agencies can kind of ride the storm and maybe focus more on their sales and marketing activity, diversify their portfolio of uh, the types of clients they work with, they'll be the ones that survive and hopefully have a booming workforce. Thank you for that, Rebecca. All, all very solid points and well made. Um, I think what's quite interesting in terms of, I mean, uh, I've heard that O&M already started to, lead, to, uh, to let people go. Um, it's, it's not just obviously the impact that that has on the people that are leaving, but obviously it's the impact it has on the culture within the agency and how it stabilises it. And in a market where those skills are very transferable and, and there's still a buyer's market for talent, um, you have to witness and be aware of the fact that the impact that can have on other people and their propensity to go elsewhere. Adam, um, you have actually witnessed both a recession, both here and uh, in the US. And um, you know, you, you have agencies that you've owned that have offices both in, in Los Angeles and, and London and elsewhere. Um, is there a difference in the approach um, that's taken by US companies from from companies in your experience in the UK when it comes to recession? Uh, not a huge difference. I mean, this is a it, it's a global issue, and we have to look at the the customer journey. Um, ultimately, a recession impacts consumer confidence, it impacts spending, and that in turn can impact shareholder value. So what we tend to see more of in the US is market consolidation, businesses buying other businesses, um, and that in turn has an impact on um, employment. So for example, my, my world is more in entertainment. We saw Disney purchasing Fox, which saw 5,000 plus layoffs. So it does have an impact on the employment market. But I agree with um, with Rebecca, you know, once customer spending is reduced, brands and agencies typically cut costs um, and that's a global response. Um, they may reduce prices. They may postpone any uh, new investments, which, again, has a, an, in, an instrumental impact on the economy. So marketing expenditure, expenditure is often the first thing to go. And that is usually a mistake and can uh, jeopardize performance in the long term. So, you know, the pressure to prove marketing return on investment will increase as it is already. We're already living in an outcomes led market. So I expect this will intensify. However, for intelligent brands and agencies, it is an opportunity as well. Um, certainly in terms of differentiating yourself from the competition, uh, the moves you make now will deliver more stability and a greater impact in the longer term, uh, both during and after the recession. So depending which sector, service category or markets you're in, agencies can thrive during a recession. Uh, there is scope for optimization, finding efficiencies, refining your proposition and values, which are very important in a recession. And for example, it's forced a lot of experiential agencies to find alternative models and revenue streams which will serve them well moving forward so we have to reshape uh, the way that we work and rethink the type of proposition that we have uh, and and be very targeted in terms of the market we're approaching okay so um, we're fortunate to have a number of brand leaders marketing directors on today's call um, and if they are sort of staring down the table at their cfo chief executive fd whoever it happens to be who's demanding that it make reductions and cuts in their budgets. 
what, what are the arguments and what are the kind of historical case histories uh, and in this particular case with this particular blend of recession that we should be putting forward and then partnering with them on to ensure that they actually are well equipped to actually counter those demands and that's kind of an open question to anybody. I'm happy to pick that up, Stephen. I, I mean, I think for me, um, I guess there's kind of four four key areas that I would always push back as an agency leader and ask um, clients in this situation, is their organisation, is their brand doing that? But I think in a downturn, as we've all said, and I think we all agree that most companies do switch to that kind of survival mode um, and they're quite defensive. Um, but I think the companies that, that kind of strive and, and, and kind of do well, I think the pillars they typically follow are First of all, debt. Companies obviously that have a large amount of debt are going to be ones that are at risk because they've got to keep up their loan payments. So you need to make more cash, you need to make more revenue to be able to do that. So I think companies in that area, as, as an agency, how can you help them make more sales so they can keep up and manage the debt they've got? I think the second pillar is decision making, which I think is really important. Often you see when your companies are in these survival modes, isolated decisions are made and they're quite knee jerky and I think organizations that have a more centralized approach and have a more holistic approach to decision making are ones that do really well as opposed to just a decision made being in isolation without consulting across the whole organization so definitely more centralized structures work well and I think as an agency you should be understanding how your brands you work with how they're structured I think is the third area which obviously we've spoken about and um I think, you know, as we said, companies that, that um, lay off workforce, it's going to cost them more, more in the long term. So I think they really need to focus on that. And the last one is digital transformation. And I think digital and technology can play a really huge part for, for, for all companies in, in kind of adopting new technologies. How can it help make workforces more efficient, give you better analytics on your customers, get them to spend more money, improve customer experiences, all those sorts of things. Some research we commissioned recently actually for the travel sector was that 66% of people we surveyed would actually pay more um, for their flight or more for their holiday than this was literally just a couple of weeks ago if the online experience was better. So actually, if you have a more premium experience, people, even though we're talking about the recession, people will actually pay more for that. So for me, they're kind of four key areas, which I think is really important uh, for companies to be looking at and for us as agency leaders to be asking companies how they're structured around those four key pillars. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to bring Tracy Burnett in. Um, I don't know whether, Tracy, your question relates to the points that Rebecca's just made. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to raise my hand, actually. Oh, well, it's so, nice to see you anyway. <laughs> Did you have a question you, at this point? I, no, I don't. But thank you very much for asking. OK, we'll, we'll, come, we'll come back to you in a moment. Uh, Patrick Woods has just said, and you've probably heard this story this morning. It's, it's, it's slightly tongue in cheek, but actually it's true. That as they're having to put security tags on packs of lure pack in certain stores, the price of butter, as you know, has sort of shot up in the last few weeks. So uh, if you've got three or four um, boxes of, or tubs of alert back in your, in your fridge, that those are now currency. So you should hang on to those. Um, OK, I mean, going back to in all seriousness, I mean, one, one of the critical things, I guess, is actually how one makes the case and uh, for actually creating long term investment in brand in this period and how, how people persuade their clients to continue to actually make those investments and give them their arguments. I mean, it's fantastic work that's been done um, through the IPA over the last few years. Many of you will be familiar with the work that's been done by Peter Field, um, uh, the long and short of it, which he co-authored. Um, I, I would suggest it's worth looking into that. Um, he, he very much makes the case for actually how one actually uses the opportunity to improve your share of voice through recession. Naturally, some people will be pulling back. And so therefore you can actually, if you just continue with your current spend, you'll actually improve your share of voice. Um, and equally to looking to actually continue to invest in brand advertising, because I think as we saw in COVID, those brands that respond to consumer needs, those brands that actually recognize how tough it is for people out there at the moment, and are seen to befriend and partner with them, will come out of this situation an awful lot better than those that basically either ignore their consumers or continue purely to just basically pass on inflationary price rises without actually putting it in the context. Um, and what we're seeing that already, I think, in, 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 you know, as demand falls, those brands that aren't engaging with their consumers are already winning, beginning to have some, 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 some problems. Um, back to um, um, the, the panel, if I may, uh, and a question really relating to a statement that was made by um, David Buttress, uh, who many of you know has been um, brought in as a sort of recessionary czar 
Um, a marketeer, a, a CEO of a very successful business. Uh, he's been brought in to actually advise government. And uh, he came out with a, 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 um, an argument last week, which is that the brands should stop spending money on advertising and discount their products instead of uh, continuing to invest in, in marketing, because he, his belief is that you should be passing those savings onto the consumer by reducing your costs. Um, does anyone have a, a view on that? I suspect you all do. Yeah, I'll, okay, I'll jump in at this point. Uh, I mean, look, I think we need to see, especially during a recession, we need to see certain behaviours from brands and agencies. And the key ones that, that I would like to see are courage, resilience, and a higher aptitude, yes, higher aptitude for risk. Um, there are plenty of studies out there. There's one by Market Sense and there's one by McGraw-Hill uh, that demonstrate that spending in a recession should actually increase. Um, it's mainly because the advertising market becomes less competitive, there's less noise, which equals more eyeballs, and it drives consumer confidence and share of voice versus the competition. So, you know, as you said before, we're seeing a lot of brands doing a lot more values based marketing because it bolsters trust. And, you know, we have to consider the false economy of cutbacks. What does that do to your trustful relationship with your loyal customer? Um, and the ability to bring them back once the uh, economy recovers. Um, so it's not necessarily about how much you spend. I think it's more about how efficiently you spend the money that you have. So digital marketing, for example, uh, which is targeted, relatively cheap and easily measurable, that becomes critical uh, in a time like this. Yeah, I mean, a number of questions that are coming in relate to the ability to be able to demonstrate an ROI. And of course, the beauty of certain channels like digital, as you say, is that you can demonstrate the, uh, um, the effect it has and through full funnel attribution. Um, it's more difficult, obviously, with, with brand building activities to be able to do that. Nonetheless, uh, there is a requirement, I think, to, to do both. And we've seen that through the studies we, we spoke about earlier on, the long and the short of it. Andrew Rogerson uh, also makes that point, you know, how do you actually get the balance between investing in what we call traditional marketing and media versus um, uh, other core areas. Um, in terms of actually putting those arguments together for your clients, um, I'm working on the assumption that agencies these days are a lot more accountable and therefore have to actually track these metrics. Um, certainly when one is going about uh, transformation and as Rebecca has spoken about, you know, you're doing big transformation projects, you're doing big builds, you're building new platforms. Um, it's it's it, you're very often talking to um, the the FDs about the longer term effect that those are going to have on um, the efficiencies they create and, and the, the opportunities that will have for growth. Whereas it's quite difficult, I think, sometimes to demonstrate the short term effects. That said, you're dealing with opex versus capex, and that can also help. Um, Spencer, what, what, what agency is saying to you at the moment? I mean, I, you obviously, what there's lots of independent smaller agencies around. You can internationally. What 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 arguments are they preparing, and what conversations are you having with them? Well, I, I think you know the pattern is you know is really building because uh, I think a lot of people saw the initial March April impact on their revenue. May sprung back for the majority of people, um, but but it's for some not enough. So you know I've I've probably got one hundred and fifty active clients that I speak to on a monthly basis and and I've already seen um you know I've already seen cutbacks the bottom line is is that as much as some agencies that are larger that have the cash in the reserves to be able to fund wage cost to GP deficit so if the wage cost of GP is too high they can fund it through cash reserves the reality is is that most smaller agencies don't have that and we don't have furlough this time you know if you just imagine 2000 and uh you imagine 2019 and 20 when if we when the first few months actually there's a few ages that actually literally had cut loads of headcount and, and closed down their business some of them closed down their businesses because the furlough scheme hadn't come out even quick enough then so we won't have furlough this time to protect us i'm just saying the smaller agencies that don't have cash reserves it's the only there's only one reason why an agency goes out of business let's not forget that as well it's because the wage cost of gp figure goes over 70 percent and and it, it runs out of cash and so you know, I think the, you know, it's going, it's going to hit people. I think the reality is that I love what Rebecca said, though, about um, uh, individual decision making being a weakness, because I think a lot of the smaller AC founders, they will make 
irrational decisions when they have a bad peak, when they when they lose one client or they have to make redundancies, they then start making a pattern. Of, I mean, I've, I've seen it so many times and they almost self-sabotage their agency. So I think that's a really, I'm going to take that to, to my client, you know, to my clients and to my network and say, look, make sure your decisions are not made in, in, in solo for that reason. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm already seeing I, I, on a Monday morning, just one last thing, Monday morning, the first call I took yes, um, yesterday was, was an agency going into CBA. Yeah, so it is happening. That's the reality of it. I actually do think that there will be some cuts. There will be more people back on the market. And I'm going to say something quite controversial right now. I think we need a damn good recession to readdress the balance between employers and employees. Yeah. The reality is the shift has gone the wrong way. It was in the past, it was bad because the employers had too much power. Yeah, of late, the employees have got too much power now. And I think, I, I generally think that, you know, how many people have you interviewed that haven't turned up for interviews? You know, how many people have you, uh, you know, there's, there's, there seems to be this, of, um, you know, a, a, a balance that needs addressing. And by the way, this, this, I've heard it twice, one person on this panel and, and the CFO friend saying that basically, you know, it was something like 25% of people who were applying for jobs didn't even bother to turn up for the interview. That's a really high number. Yeah, I, I witnessed that last time, uh, last week, actually, with three interviews. I, yeah, listen, it's, that, that is fairly controversial. <laughs> I wouldn't expect anything less than... Uh, can, I, can I respond to that? Sorry. Um, because I talk to a lot of organisations who are, are saying exactly what you said, Spencer. You know, and a lot of them, if I'm honest with you, are a generation, particularly I'm working with lots of partners who are going, you know, it's ridiculous. Who did this lot think they are? They're demanding this. They're asking for this. You know, in my day, you know, we did this. We did that. You know, this is the only way you can work. It's, you know, back into the office. You know, the only way they can really learn is being osmosis, being next to me. And um, I would say <laughs> that actually mm. there is a piece of work to be done, which is for the two generations to get closer together and understand each other because the motivations and what the new you know, generation Z and Y want isn't what the previous generations want. They don't want the big house. They don't want, you know, so they are making decisions and yeah. behaving in a way based on new motivations. And I think it's about get, you know, the two generations. It's, but Cindy, even the agency owners that I work with, they are the, the, new, the new, the now, the next, right? So these are all the young ones that run by Gen Zs even those guys are having challenges. It's not, it, I agree what you say. I'm not being extremist. I'm just saying there is definitely, a, you know, I had a client yesterday ring me up. One of the members of staff had asked for a 35,000 pound pay rise. Yeah. To, because, and like, you know, what do you do in those situations? It, it feels like there's, there needs to be a little bit more empathy and understanding, you know, between employees and employees just saying i don't think i'm as extremely I, 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 about. I, I, I totally agree with that. and also it's about etiquette too and i think there's a kind of a, a kind of yeah, light etiquette. of an etiquette that we, 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 what you're referring to there actually uh, annabelle's come up with a wonderful idea which you may already do within your agencies which is reverse buddy mentoring we get a senior person and a junior person you know to work together on actually implementing a, a system uh, we've seen for one of our agencies um agency um in in the southwest they put together a new what they call I don't think they call it a contract, but a kind of employee handshake, which was a book that basically just talked about how they wanted to basically work and respect each other, how things had changed uh, in terms of both the demands of Gen Zs, but equally to what had happened post COVID and, and so on. But you make a good point. And, and, you know, I think that obviously if there is a retraction in the business, then you will imagine that there will be um, more people available. And for those successful agencies, that will be a positive opportunity for growth. Equally, too, some of these agencies are actually suffering at the moment. Um, I imagine will be um, a, a, a agencies only too happy to pick up that talent, um, or indeed happy to pick up those those smaller agencies at a bargain price. I mean, just to say, I think Gen Z is only just coming to the workforce, and they were actually affected by the two thousand eight recession. And my experience with Gen Z is that they have a very different work ethic to the yeah. generation before. It's actually much. I think we're going to see more positiveness from that generation coming in everything i've seen so far i think i've spoken to people you know who are employing you know young people that's what they're saying to me there is a very there's a much better progressive way yes they do, do work differently they like to work a start a lot later and work later into the night but it's there are some things there but I, I think actually gen z is actually a white flag for all of us i have to say 
I'd like if in the last few minutes, in that sort of five minutes, to hear from some of uh, the brand owners and, and, and clients that we've got on today's calls to, to understand exactly what's happening in their business. You don't have to reveal what business it is, but it'd be just interesting to know what's happening with talent, uh, what's happening with the demands that have been put upon you in terms of reducing spend, just to get a feel. So if, if, if you're able to, um, and happy to just ask a question, um, if you're in one of those positions, that would be fantastic. Uh, Stephen, while we wait, hopefully, for some questions to come in from some brand people, we, we often get asked for um, examples of brands that have kind of thrived and done well during recessions, because obviously, as CEO, as CFO, they want examples, they want to know, should they carry on doing a digital transformation program that's running for five or 10 years, or should they switch it off? And I, I, I was kind of like thinking back, and I was thinking back to kind of actually a couple of kind of companies that specifically were impacted kind of like 2008 2009 in the US and I think Netflix is a really good example I think everybody obviously sees Netflix as this massive giant obviously really really successful but they almost went under back in 2008 and what kind of saved them was innovation and I know it may sound quite counterintuitive to a lot of companies to think well why should I be you know investing in innovation when there's maybe a recession going on but you know they just thought about things differently and they developed new partnerships they started working with xbox to allow people to stream things and i think what we need to do as agency leaders is kind of put that business hat on and that business angle to go well how can we actually help the brands we're working with to have that more entrepreneurial approach and how can we help them problem solve to come up with ways maybe they can engage with new audiences or do things in a different way so i think netflix is a good example there and also lego who were not really massively in 2008, particularly big in, in Europe at the time. And their US market just completely bombed because people were not buying toys for children because they were cutting back naturally. And actually they really invested and concentrated on setting up operations in Europe and then totally dominated the market and obviously have become massively successful. So I think there's ways in which as, as agency leaders and as kind of trusted partners to brands, we, we can be helping advising and getting involved in those conversations. And I think agencies that can have those conversations again will be the ones that thrive rather than yeah. being less passive at the moment. And you know, I, I almost think we have um, a right in the sense that we have a responsibility, should I say, to actually be talking to clients about innovation and creativity in this period. Because often in that in kind of recessionary gap, as you say, because the day-to-day -day may actually not be as engaging or as busy as it is normal, you've actually got time to actually give some uh, some time and energy to thinking about actually more strategic opportunities within the business. So as we saw you know, in the two-year two period of COVID, people did innovate, they had to in order to survive. Equally too, I think we've got an opportunity through recession in the next 12 months. Sam Watkins, um, you've got, got a question here. If costs have to decrease and savings have to be made for clients, where do we suggest that we start? if we don't follow the government's advice of cutting marketing. Any thoughts on that? t and &E? <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I personally think there's always efficiencies to be made in any, com any company, any organisation. Um, I won't name this particular company, but, um, you know, you go in sometimes to an organisation and you've got 10 people all doing the same thing on paper when it could be digitalised and you could have three people doing it. And of course, that's not what those employees want to hear. But I think there are efficiencies that would actually make ways of working better for some companies. And maybe this is the time to do it as opposed to kind of just leaving those things. So I think there's always efficiencies to be had, which in the long term, the company should have been doing anyway. So for me, I would be focusing on those quick wins as opposed to just naturally switching off marketing. And going back to um, Rebecca's point about decision making on its own, I say the more that you can involve large groups of people in coming up with those ideas, so rather than them being centrally, you know, mandated, push it right out to the front line and ask them and empower them to do it. And you'll get some great ideas coming out of them where they see those duplications or they, they see these things that no one's asked them before. So I'd say involve, be transparent about it, share the problem and share the load. And then you'll get those get those ideas coming through thick and fast. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see actually as we go through collective bargaining and uh, looking at various other strikes along the line, whether actually management adopts that stance and starts to actually say, let's get around the table and talk about potential solutions. How can we work together to find ways in which we can both achieve our common objectives here? So that, that'll be fascinating with RMT and others. OK. Um, Listen, I'd, I'd like to thank everybody on today's panel. Um, it's been a very, uh, I think, a robust conversation. I also feel it's kind of the opening. Um, and what I'm going to suggest that we do 
if everyone's up for this, is that we continue this conversation um, on email or through other means and actually work together as we go through um, what's going to be a tough 12 to 18 month period and regularly check in and come back to this conversation because I think there are going to be further things that we can share with each other, as lessons that we can learn, mistakes that we'll all naturally make. But I do feel if we can come back together and discuss these things that we can be more helpful to each other and to uh, the brands and clients that we support. And equally too, um, brand owners, you know, please do tell us what you expect from your agencies. What's been helpful? Um, what, what hasn't been helpful? Um, how it worked for you during the downturn, during COVID, and, and what you would like to see from our agencies as, as we uh, go through what's going to be a tough period for us all. I'd like to thank, of course, um, all members of the panel, but I'd also like to thank Oliver for putting together a very interesting um, insight into exactly where we are. Um, Oliver, I'm sure, will be very happy to share with you the results from today's poll when they come out, um, which will be fascinating. Obviously, you can't help divorce politics from the current economic situation. So as things evolve there, I'm sure it will have both positive and negative impacts on where we are. Um, all I'll also say, uh, we've got a, a publisher of paper next week, which will be available to download from our website on recessionary tactics and what one can learn, what one can do. I'll also share some papers after this call, um, references and so on and so forth. Um, so you can download that from our website. I think it will be available next week, Teresa, I think so. We've also got a podcast coming out on the subject in the next few weeks. And, and more broadly, you know, all I would say is, as Man said, we've got over 200 uh, agencies and consultants, 3,500 people who are there to help um, with all manner of different marketing services, something like 97 different marketing services when we last spoke. So if you do have a brief, however large or small, um, do, do take the opportunity to share it with us. We're really too happy to give you a point of view. Thank you once again. Have a great uh, non-recessionary day because we're not there yet. And um, let's uh, hope we can uh, get back to normal trading as soon as possible. And, and, and thanks for your time. Cheers. Bye-bye.